Hello, my name is Ed Chapman, and this videocast will cover the first part of membrane structure and function. Our understanding of cell membranes is based on models. Uh, scientists use models to explain things that they can't observe directly. And because cell membranes are so tiny and so delicate and difficult to preserve on slides in a way that preserves their structure and their function, scientists have been using models for over 100 years to explain uh, the structure of, of cell membranes. So we can use cell membranes as a good example of science as a process. That's one of our important themes in this course because science is constantly changing and improving as more data is collected. Starting early in the 1900s or late in the 1800s, around 1895, scientists figured out that the cell membrane is made up mostly of lipids, those oily molecules that we've talked about before. They're macromolecules built from fatty acids and glycerols. And these are the primary components of cell membranes. How do we know this? Well, it's because materials that dissolve in lipids seem to pass through cell membranes faster than materials that are water-soluble. So the hydrophobic Phobic materials, like other lipids, seem to pass through cell membranes quicker. So this led scientists to the conclusion in the late 1800s that cell membranes were made from lipids. A little bit later, around 1925, some, uh, scientists figured out that cell membranes are actually built from a bilayer of phospholipids. Now phospholipids have a dual nature. They have a hydrophilic head end with a phosphate group on it and some hydrophobic tails made of fatty acids and they arrange themselves in a way so that their hydrophilic phosphate ends are always facing towards the water and scientists in 1925 realized that cell membranes must contain a bilayer of phospholipids because a bilayer is about the only stable boundary you can have between two aqueous compartments. And what that means is a phospholipid bilayer sets up a situation where the inside of a cell, the cytoplasm, is separated from the environment, both of these places being aqueous or containing a lot of water, in a way that allows the hydrophilic ends to be bonding with the water in the environment and in the cytoplasm and the hydrophobic tails being protected on the inside. In 1935, two scientists, Davison and Daniele, proposed a model that incorporates proteins into the, into the bilayer. And why did they do this? Well, experimental evidence shows that cell membranes were more hydrophilic, they're more attracted to water than a pure phospholipid bilayer would explain. So they realized that proteins are actually part of the cell membrane also. And then finally, around 1972, two other scientists, Singer and Nicholson, modified the older sandwich model to incorporate proteins that actually float or sink into the phospholipid bilayer and kind of bob around like corks in a swimming pool. And why is this? Well, our better understanding of the three-dimensional nature of protein molecules has led us to understand that proteins are amphipathic. Uh, this means they have regions that attract water and regions that repel water. And the only way to explain the presence of these proteins in a phospholipid bilayer is if they embed themselves in the bilayer so that their hydrophobic regions are away from the water and their hydrophilic regions are closer to the water molecules. New data from freeze fracture technology has supports this idea that the phospholipid bilayer contains embedded proteins. If you freeze a cell membrane and then split it, it's going to break along its weakest um, fault line, which is going to be between the phospholipid bilayer. And if you look at these layers while they're frozen, you can see the knobs and projections and holes left over from where the proteins were, which proves that these proteins are in fact embedded in the phospholipid bilayer. Okay, membranes are fluid, and what this means is that the phospholipids and the proteins are constantly in motion, moving around in relationship to each other. Uh, you may remember that video we watched earlier when you saw phospholipid uh, molecules and the embedded proteins floating around in these raft-like structures that you see in this slide. Phospholipids and proteins drift about, they're not locked in place, and this was proven with an experiment involving a hybrid between mouse and human cells. And this was done very simply. If you take a mouse cell and a human cell and you set a situation up where they will combine or fuse together, if the, the, the components of the cell membrane are moving around, it's going to be completely clear looking at the hybrid that the intermixed protein molecules the, the mouse proteins and the human proteins prove that these proteins are moving around. If they didn't move around, the hybrid would remain half mouse and half human with the two parts distinct from each other. But we know now that they mix. So this was a very simple little experiment that proved that. 
Okay, cell membranes also incorporate cholesterol molecules. Now remember, cholesterol molecules are a type of lipid. Um, they're lipid soluble. And what they do is they reduce the fluidity at moderate temperatures. They keep cell membranes from becoming too loose at moderate temperatures. And at the same time, they hinder or prevent cell membranes from solidifying or turning solid at low temperatures. So cholesterol is, com is a completely important molecule for the proper functioning of cell membranes. All right, now we're going to look at more detail at an animal cell or animal plasma membrane. And it's got lots of parts here, as you can see in this diagram. We're going to look at them one by one. First thing I guys want you to notice is down towards the bottom is where the cytoplasm is, and up towards the top is where the extracellular fluid is. Now the extracellular fluid is the liquid surrounding animal cells in a living situation. And attached to the inside of the cytoplasm side of the cell membrane are cytoskeleton elements. These remember could be microtubules, microfilaments, or intermediate filaments. Now, embedded in the phospholipid bilayer are proteins called integral proteins because they're integrated into the phospholipid bilayer. They're, they're the, the embedded proteins. You may have heard them referred to as embedded proteins. Now, stuck to them on the inside or the outside can be what we call peripheral proteins. These are proteins that aren't necessarily embedded in the phospholipid bilayer but are attached to it in some way. You also have attached to the cell membrane carbohydrate chains, big long chains of carbohydrates. They're colored green here in this picture. And if those carbohydrates are attached to proteins, they're called glycoproteins. Glyco, of course, refers to the carbohydrate nature of the chain, glyco like glucose. And if they're attached to the lipid molecules, they're called glycolipids. Surprise, surprise. The words make sense. Now, on the outside or in the extracellular matrix surrounding animal cells, you have other fibers like collagen fibers and other fibers. They all have names. We're not going to worry too much about them right now. But these fibers are there to either lock the animal cell in place or, or make it loosely attached to other cells or in some way modify the way it positions itself in tissues. All right, those membrane carbohydrates are responsible for cell-to-cell -cell recognition. Uh, cells, animal cells use these carbohydrates to tell each other apart. And you may have heard back in uh, freshman biology about the ABO blood groups when you did genetics. Uh, humans either are type A, type B, type O, or type AB. Well, the reason why these why people differ in their blood types is because they differ in the type and size of carbohydrates they have attached to their red blood cells. All right. Cell, cell membranes are responsible for controlling the traffic or the movement of molecules across the cell membrane. And this is directly determined by the structure of the cell membrane. And cell membranes are what we call selectively permeable, or they are semi-permeable. They'll let some things through, but not other things. Some molecules flow through freely in both directions in response to diffusion gradients. And these free diffusing molecules are pretty familiar. They're small, and they don't have a charge. Carbon dioxide, oxygen, and water, water um, molecules are three of the molecules that diffuse in and out of cell membranes with no problem. They go both ways according to their own diffusion gradients, moving from where there's a lot of them to where there's less of them. Other molecules are regulated, and these molecules are regulated if they're ionic, if they have a charge associated with them, such as sodium ions, potassium ions, and calcium ions. They can't move freely through the phospholipid bilayer. They have to, be, they have to get in some different ways. And now the last one being chlorine ions. Other molecules are completely blocked. They can't get through under normal situations. Because they're too large, or for example, things like starches, large proteins, and DNA and RNA. These normally do not move through cell membranes with any ease. All right, the proteins that are embedded in the phospholipid bilayer, which we call integral proteins, have six basic functions. They transport molecules through by acting as transport um, proteins. They are responsible for enzymatic activity. They are taking in substrates and changing them into products. Or they're involved in cell signaling, which is connected to that idea of cell-to-cell -cell recognition. Or a cell being turned on or turned off and what it does um, based on um, these integral proteins. 
Uh, these integral proteins are also there to join cells together, um, intercellular joining, like what we saw with tight junctions and gap junctions um, previously in the, in the chapter before this one. And they're also involved in cells recognizing and reacting to each other in some way. And finally, they provide a framework to which extracellular cytoskeleton materials can attach. So they can attach parts on the inside of the cell and the cytoplasm to the cell membrane or things that are outside the cell to the cell itself. We're going to spend most of the time talking about transport proteins. Uh, tend to be the most confusing part of what cell membranes do. But we're going to do that in the next presentation. So we're going to stop here.